everything looking good and we're live hello everybody so now we have uh, a discussion on uh, cypherpunk to solarpunk with uh, chris alice and chimenzi tutor um chimenzi tutor has been working on a project to make a really nice device which is like a, a full node lightning node um, which is powered exclusively by solar or maybe not exclusively but it can be powered by solar um uh, so you know in a a country which has a lot of sun you know you'll be able to run one of these things and uh because it's linked to a uh, lithic mine battery or an, a, a lead acid battery uh, it's able to store the power from the sun and then use that then to power the power the uh, the node um so it's a really interesting project and i i was very impressed with the price because when i first saw this i thought oh no a hardware scam and then i looked at the prices and i was like wow you know this is you know this that's a very reasonable and fair price for such a thing uh, probably you know it's probably too cheap to be honest because I've, I've done some solar stuff in the past and i understand how much all this stuff costs um so a, a really refreshing great project uh nice to see um uh and uh yeah so so chris alice and Terenzi here to talk about that um and, and chris if you want to you know do your thing yeah great so hello everyone my name is chris ellis and uh, i was asked to do this presentation actually yesterday for the uh, Bitcoin SOFA at the CCC this year. Um, and so many of us uh, uh, sort of in, in this uh, sort of quiet corner of the Bitcoin community, we sort of call ourselves well, hackers or makers and we like to do things. We like to participate in the network. And uh, last summer, I guess leading up to, to last summer, uh, after the COVID uh, situation, I started to think about a little bit more about self-reliance and self-sustainability, and I was really getting into environmentalism. I went to some meetups near where I live uh, to do with solar punk, and I went down the rabbit hole. So, uh, yes, so today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, solar punk, but we're also, I'm going to try and marry together these two communities that I think have a lot in common and a lot to learn from one another. And I'm just going to start by uh, covering this image here. Um, this was from a blog post by Alyssa Hull on Hope Punk. Um, and one of the things I really encourage you to, to read it, it's, it's a, a fairly recent one, I suppose, within the last year this article was written. But she makes this really, really good point, uh, which is that we desperately need narratives that move past apocalypse as an endpoint. She is, of course, referring to uh, the climate change and the climate crisis. I do think it's not just about saving the Earth, it's mostly about saving ourselves. And so I'm going to explain to you uh, my journey and, and invite you to come along with me. So what is solar punk? Well, I can give you this rather boring definition from Wikipedia, but I thought it would be much more interesting if I give you this, uh, I think, a much more poetic uh, description from an unfrequented YouTube uh, channel uh, by a, a, a chap naming himself St. Andrew. I encourage you to check it out. We'll be putting the link to this uh, slideshow in the description of this video. And uh, yeah, so let, let me quote it to you. Solar punk is a shining vision of our future grounded in our existing world that emphasizes the need for environmental sustainability, self-governance and social justice. It's a movement dedicated to human centric and ecocentric ends. It's a futurism that focuses on what we should hope for rather than what we should avoid. Solar punk is about ingenuity, generativity, independence and community. It's suffixed by punk because it opposes the existing world. It creates local resilience, authorities be damned, from rooftop solar to guerrilla gardening. I know that's wonderful. I think he encapsulates it perfectly. So yes, it is uh, largely an aesthetic movement. It's uh, you know governing art. But what I like about it is it's positive. It actually gives us something to work towards. It gives us acts of commission that we can engage in rather than just being uh, something to be against. And so we have a lot to look forward to within this industry. Um, it's not just uh, the, you know, the, the, the sort of solar punk. If you, if you think about it, actually, the, the, the sun is by far the biggest contributor to, to global climate. If it weren't for the sun, it would just be a, an ice rock floating in the sky at this point. Um, but there are other, uh, obviously, environmental projects. On the left here, we have gravity batteries. You might not be able to tell from that image, but it's basically a series of bricks that are powered by renewable energy during the daytime, usually when the sun is out, perhaps solar, perhaps some wind. It picks up the bricks and it stacks them 
uh, here into this tower. And then at night time, when the energy is actually required, when people are coming home from work, the batteries are lowered and the gravity that stored that potential energy from the daytime powers a dynamo, which then uh, outputs the energy uh, to the villages and the towns and the cities. And the reason why this, this might be desirable is because there are no chemicals involved, right? So we'll be talking a little bit about lithium ion and lead acid batteries, all of which have a certain chemical hazards associated with them. So there's lots of ingenious ideas like this. And then on the right, we have another example of agrivoltaics. It's one of my favorite. These Solar panels are bifacial. That means that they can charge electricity both from the front and the back. Uh, these form uh, basically a synergy with the crops beneath them because a lot of crops, they like shaded light. They don't necessarily need direct light. So the solar panels serve a dual purpose. There's an ancillary benefit that we can get um, and that frees up a lot of space. We now don't have to dedicate a whole bunch of, you know, uh, so many acres of land for, for putting solar panels. We can now put the solar panels on top of certain crops types um, in order to, to harness the, the sun's energy. So let's ju juxtapose now with the other community, the one that I began with, um, which is the uh, cypherpunk, the Bitcoiners, people that are privacy minded and, and, and are conscious of the change that are making. Now, this is a transition that, that, that similar to environmentalists and eco warriors does also start off with the prosecution, like all good revolutions, a prosecution of the past, chancellor on the brink of second bailout of the banks. Of course, the famous Times article there that its founder Satoshi, he, she or they decided to inform us at the beginning of their project that this was what they were orientated against. But like solar punk and like the environmentalists, it's also a positive vision of the future. It doesn't just say what it's against. It gives us a prescription of what we can do now in a very material way. Um, and one of the, the sort of the, the big takeaways that I took from it was this sort of realization that money distributes value over time and currency distributes value across space, that in a way that this was a development from the old sort of stores of value like gold and silver, which are very heavy and burdensome and require, uh, you know, physical security into something that was uh, lighter, as I, Satoshi even described it, as a colorless metal. Um, it doesn't need to be interesting or, or exciting. And I, I think there is, um, I think that there is a, a lesson here about the difference between genius and wisdom. A genius is often very spontaneous, very hot. They come around very infrequently. I mean, true genius, veritable genius, not just you know someone calling themselves a genius. And typically, when they do come along, they share an insight. The insight can't be unlearned. Society just has to now live with the fact that this 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 uh, invention has been created. You can either deny it and say, no, it's dead. It, it conflicts with my existing world for you. Or you can change your world for you and start to adapt and think, okay, well, okay, this technology is here. It exists. We can't stop it. We can't stop anyone else from using it. And that really requires the wise, the gardeners, the janitors, the caretakers. The, these people can understand the genius in a way that the genius can't understand themselves because they see the world from a, from a very different perspective. But what they lend the genius is sustainability over time. They take the instability of the genius and they make it stable and they make it uh, dependable and repeatable. And I think that that's the, the position that we are now in. What we need uh, for Bitcoin are, are the maintainers and the janitors of, of, of its protocol. This picture is very relevant. Over Christmas, I uh, watched Oliver Stone's film, Nixon, from 1995. And I don't know if you recognize this image, any of you out there, but this is from 1960. And there was a wonderful quote in that film where I think one of Nixon's aides says to Nixon after he loses the election to Kennedy, Kennedy stole the election fair and square. And not only is it relevant to the current news cycle that I'm sure you've all been bored with, whether you're American or not, because we all have to engage in American politics. Um, I, it's relevant because I wanted to point something out, which is that to vote really just means to express a wish. You're basically informing an institution that's quite divorced from your daily life, that is politics, and you're telling it, look, please, could you just do this for me? And as we're learning now, probably a little bit too late for my American friends, 
they're learning that it doesn't quite work like that. You know, it's a republic, which means that you know, there are these, these sort of electors that they have to all meet in the Congress and they don't necessarily have to vote for the person that you told them to. There, there are ways around it. Now, as it turns out, it looks like uh, Biden is going to be uh, put, put in power. And so it turns out that the, the, these caveats weren't necessary. But it's a reminder, an important reminder that democracy, demos, klatos, people, power, isn't just about outsourcing your choices to a bunch of uh, largely, I would argue, unaccountable representatives. That's representative democracy, but it's not true people power the way demos kratos means. And if you've been involved in Bitcoin in, in any kind of technical way, if you've ever installed uh, Bitcoin D or Bitcoin QT on your, on your laptop, for example, you've got your hands dirty on it. Maybe you even logged into your home router and, and opened up the port forwarding so that you, you know, so that you could actually be a listening node. If you even know what that word means, this presentation is for you because you don't just want to be passive. You don't just want to be in this master slave paradigm where you're going to outsource uh, all of your, your storage to the cloud, to some Silicon Valley darlings that are probably doing all kinds of deals on the back end with their VCs and trying to, you know, have all these various business interests that might conflict with your you actually want to download the blockchain because you believe that it's important for you. It's important for the community around you that wants to connect and query uh, that data. And so here we are. There has been, and this has always been true since I've been in Bitcoin circa 2012, 13, a sort of an interest in this idea of set it and forget it hardware. That it's something you just set up in your home, you plug it in, and then it does something. It performs some utility on the network. And we've seen now with Ethereum 2.0 and, and the staking, this, this trend is not going away. And I think the reason why it's not going away is because what these kinds of devices and these kinds of staking wallets really are is a form of UBI or uh, universal basic income. What people are really wanting right now in, in a world of, you know, unstable uh, jobs and, and not being able to necessarily be able to prove their worth to the economy and be able to get a reliable income is they want passive income. They want to be able to plug something in, it provides minimal utility, and then they are able to get some kind of basic income that they can live off so that they don't have to go to the state, humiliate themselves, trying to justify their needs or go to a boss and have to justify their worth to that boss every day. Um, they just want to exist. But I think something that's very problematic, of course, is that, that you know the world population is predicted to, to reach 10 billion by the year 2030. And there is largely a fixed supply of resources. So this is going to present a challenge for human beings uh, on the planet, I think. Um, and I think also I would just like to quote one of my favorite thinkers in the space, Taylor Swift. Uh, largely, this is a problem of scale. Taylor says, trust does not scale because trust is not reducible to math. We have to think about the way that small systems don't work in the same way at, at a large scale. Right, systems that work at a small scale work differently at a large scale, to put it differently. Um, perhaps, you know, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, you could go to your bank manager in your local village. He probably knew you. You could apply for a loan, get a bank account, get an overdraft. But these days, we live in a world of global corporations. They don't have time to get to know you in that personable face to face way. So everything has to be done with algorithms. And that kind of a system is hard to sustain. And so we, we need to think about that. OK. Let's go into the practical, uh, the nitty gritty, because the subtitle of, of this presentation was a practical utopia. So just to warn you, I am not an engineer. Um, I'm just a hacker. I'm a creative really at heart. And I did have help in my journey on uh, creating a solar powered full node from actual engineers. Um, I invited two friends of mine around, uh, one by the name of Handel, uh, sorry, Candle and uh, Julian. They came around to my apartment and they helped me install it so that I knew I was uh, being very safe. I was using fuses and circuit breakers and, and all the correct things. So the goals for this project was that I wanted to learn by doing. I want to expand my knowledge. Although I am a, quite a creative person, I, I have an envy, I think, of of technicians and engineers. I, I love what they do. Um, I find it very empowering. And so I wanted to learn it. The second goal was to increase my resiliency. And as you will see in this presentation, I largely do that by building redundancy. That means buying two of every component um, so that I've always got something spare, so that I've always got some power 
in case there's power outages, in case there's an Armageddon because of COVID, um, I would have some energy that, that could satisfy basic requirements like access to telephone, access to the internet. And then thirdly, with minimal negative environmental impact. So you'll see that I'll be upcycling, that means reusing things that are currently unused, buying batteries secondhand rather than buying them brand new. Um, and so that, that really was the third requirement. But my goal for today is not to teach you how to do this because we don't have time, it's far too complex, but really just to introduce you. My goal today is really to take you to the door of the warren, as it were, so that you can explore the rabbit hole if you really want to. So how it started, I made this tweet over the summer on Twitter, it went viral. Um, energy independent, economic, full node, no state required. Of course, there is a little small print. If you go click on that tweet, you'll see that I do say that, of course, apart from all the regulations and the safety compliance, that, you know, the manufacturers of the solar panel have to put in place. Of course, I'm a little tongue in cheek here. I am realistic, although I am an aspiring anarchist. I, I realize that right now we are very dependent on the state. Um, so a 50 watt solar panel, something called a PWM solar controller and a 17 amp hour lead acid battery, two things to mention here. You cannot just get power directly from a solar panel. It does, it, it will be unregulated uh, if it just comes directly from the solar panel. So almost all solar systems rely on this little white box here in the middle of the image on the left, uh, which is a solar charge controller that will take the raw power from the solar panel and it will regulate it and, and output it to a device uh, like this Raspberry Pi on the left and also at the same time to a battery where it can be stored for later use. It developed over the summer, I got really excited. I was quite impressed. Um, by the power I was generating from the 50 watts. So I went out uh, to a shop called uh, Sonnen Republic in Berlin and I bought two 120 watt solar panels. Now the pa panels pictured here, um, I think they cost um, around, uh, I wanna say 200 euros each or so, maybe just a little bit less. They are actually portable panels. So these are not the panels you see typically on people's roofs. These panels are marketed to people with balconies like me. As you can see, it's a south facing balcony. So I get lots of good exposure to the sun. Um, they're marketed towards people that uh, live the van life, you know, that, that are going around in vans, the mobile homes, uh, boats, they're waterproof. Um, in fact, here you can see the droplets of water on there because I was actually cooling the solar panels. They were getting very hot over the summer. And by cooling a solar panel, you can increase its efficiency. I upgraded from a PWM controller to an MPPT controller, something called, um, there's even the model there, EP Ever, one of the best manufacturers of solar charge controllers. That's just a better uh, charge controller. Um, it consumes slightly more energy passively in the background than the PWM, uh, but it does give you better overall performance. It gives you more energy uh, from, from the solar panels. And then, of course, the 3000 watts inverter. The reason being was because I wanted to be able to not only power a full node, I also, like I said in the goals section, I wanted to potentially power a home with this if I wanted to. It wouldn't power my home for very long um, because I'll explain the calculations later, but it would be enough, for example, for me to heat up some water or to cook something quickly to power, um, you know, obviously power a laptop quite easily. And so that, that was the kind of re uh, resilience I was looking for. But this is how it's going currently in Northern Europe. As you can see, it is gray days. And unfortunately, the solar panels aren't outputting too much right now, not, not even enough to power a full node for 21 consecutive days, sadly. Um, so I have had to unplug the, the full node um, sometime, I think, uh, in November when the cloudy days were rolling in. Um, but we've got some strategies to get around that. So let's let's try to uh, size what we need to figure out, like how much of a footprint does this solar system need to be to power something as small as a single board computer? Well, living in Northern Europe, and before we get to Chimezi in a little bit, who who is from the Af African continent, um, we are. I'm addressing mostly Northern Europeans, people on the 35th parallel, right? Um, we only get around 3.3 hours of sun on a day uh, over the year. However, that is a mean average. It doesn't tell us the whole picture. And when you're budgeting, you should think about, uh, do you want your, your node to have 
the five nines of uptime, right? So the, the so-called 99.99999% uptime uh, for resiliency. If you're not running a lightning node and you're just running a, a regular full node and you're just querying the node over your local network, for example, you perhaps might think to yourself, well, it's not super important. I, you know, this thing can, can go down from time to time. But if you're running lightning, you will, of course, need a stable connection because if you have power outages, you could suffer data loss. And then, you know, if you're not keeping uh, state chain backups, then that could land you in some trouble and you could lose some funds. So I'm going to be aiming for the, nine, the five nines of uptime if I can get it. Okay, so basic, basic physics. You might remember this from school. Amps like the lamps, volts provide the jolts. A lot of teachers use diagrams like this one. The volts really are the, you know, the the, the impetus of the energy uh, behind behind the current, how fast it is going. Uh, the amps are more like the lake, to use a water analogy. Um, they are like the body of water, the overall volume of, of energy that you have. We're mostly going to be concerned with volts and amps rather than the resistance that's represented in ohms in this diagram. And just to drive it home, um, you have more water analogies that physicists and engineers like to use. And what we're going to get from, from these two values, the volts and the amps, is we're going to get the power, which is measured in watts. And it's the rate at which work is done or energy is transferred over a given unit of time. So this calculation is going to unlock all the other things that we need. And here are the basic minimum viables that, that you're going to need in order to set the system up. Uh, you're going to need, obviously, a Raspberry Pi 4, an equivalent single board computer. You're going to need a solar panel. I did use a 50 watts panel over the summer you saw in the first image. But actually, what I realized is that that was only really viable on bright, sunny days. Um, as soon as you got cloud cover, the battery would go down very, very quickly. You're going to need either a lead acid or a lithium battery. If it's a lead acid, you're going to need 100 amp hours realistically um, to be able to pay it, you know, power it for any meaningful amount of time. With a lithium, you only need 50 amp hours. Let me briefly explain why that is. Um, there's a, a few slides. Lithium, apps, lithium batteries are a new technology um, that don't have as many stringent requirements on uh, cycling. That means to power the battery up to its maximum and let it drain down. They're a little bit more flexible. They're also lighter, and but at the moment they are a little bit more expensive. The reason I went with the, the lead acid over the, the lithium in this case is because right now lithium batteries are almost 100% recyclable thanks to the automotive industry, which drove up demand for, for recycling plants. So remember my third requirement was to try to be as economically sustainable as I possibly could. I didn't want to go off spending quite a lot of money in Europe actually for, for these lithium batteries. I know that there are new technologies entering the market, but I wanted to try to keep it low cost and 100% recyclable. And industry experts do say that lithium batteries should achieve the same uh, abilities to be recycled in the next five to 10 years when, once the industry, uh, uh, you know, the business case is validated for that and the entrepreneurs roll in. You will need a solar charge controller. As I said, you can get away with the PWM. That's no problem. They're typically that white box that I showed you are quite cheap, but you can get them. Well, I would recommend that you don't get them from Amazon, but if you really must, you can. Try to source as much of this stuff locally. If you can, go to eBay. Uh, try buying off of somebody. There's lots of people who just have these things, you know, it, you know, they're not using them. They bought them because they got excited about it and they didn't use it. Try to find those people. Try not to import all this stuff if you, if you can help it. So you'll need a solar charge controller. Brand new, they're about 30 pounds or 30 euros. In America, I understand they're a little bit cheaper, maybe 15 to 20 dollars. You're going to need wiring and cables. I would recommend copper. If you go for a large battery system like mine, you're going to need the kind of wires that are used in cars. That's two gauge wire, very thick wire, because you want to keep the resistance low. Um, you don't want the, 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 the components, the lugs here on this picture to start heating up. So do use thick cables if you're going to go for a large system. Smaller systems, you don't need to. And actually, the MC4 adapters, these are the standard adapters um, that are used uh, for, for solar panels. A lot of the time, you can buy these systems as kits, and you won't need to worry too much about the wiring. Um, it will be given to you as a, a ready-to-set-up to system, so you won't need to get your hands too dirty. Nice to haves would be things like a handheld amp meter, the kind you see electricians have. That can be helpful. You will need to be monitoring the, the, the voltage of your batteries. The voltage that's quoted to you by the solar charge controller isn't always 100% accurate. So nice to have, not absolutely necessary, but it's good to have around. You also have, I'm giving you the brand name here. I use a Port Powell 
uh, USB power monitor. It's a little USB device, plugs into the solar charge controller. You then plug the Pi into the USB port on the uh, power monitor, and that will actually tell you the volts and the amps in real time uh, of what you're consuming, what the Pi is consuming, and that could be good information for you to know. You could monitor its overall energy usage. Um, yeah, and then you can also get like the digital voltmeters. So if you didn't want to get a handheld amp meter, which can be quite expensive, you can just get these cheap little um, devices that you you plug onto your your battery, and then it'll tell you that the the volts in real time. Crimpers, things for trimming the cables. If you really wanted to put the lugs on them yourself, um, you can get remote controllers for for the solar charge controller. So that if you're charge controllers in another room you can run a, a cable some of them even have bluetooth and you can monitor your solar system from another room somewhere um and then pictured right this actually is i've, I've got one of these i need to set it up but this is a, a step down so what this means is that you wouldn't need an inverter you can go dc direct current to dc just very briefly, DC stands for direct current. Batteries, things like mobile phones, laptops, portables, typically operate on what's known as direct current. Your grid system in your house, your kettle, your cooker, probably your TV, that all runs on something called alternating current. We don't have time to go into the technicals on that. As a result though, Appliances that are DC cannot run directly off of uh, AC without uh, one of those annoying, um, transformer things, these boxes you have to carry around with the power adapters is what we call them. You have to carry it around with you ever, it's very annoying. And that's because your laptop is actually a direct current, has a battery inside of it, but you plug it into the grid system, which is alternated current, you need a converter. So an inverter is just the opposite of a converter. It, it basically takes the DC current and converts it back into AC. So with, a, with one of these little um, DC step downs, it's literally, it's called a buck because it only costs a buck, it only costs $1. You can plug your battery, uh, you solder the cables, uh, or the positive and negative onto these ends, and then you just plug the raspberry pi into that. Gives you more efficiency, you're not losing, you know, with system losses, converting, converting the DC to AC and back again. Um, so I'm looking forward to get started with that once the sun comes out again. So yeah, just some more pictures. Very easy to set up. It looks complicated. If you're not into solar, you're looking at this picture going, oh, where do I even start? I promise you this, this slide presentation will get, give you everything you need to get started on the journey. Um, so there's the Raspberry Pi, the full node. I got the Raspberry Blitz. I got the special edition, uh, the case made by Open Noms. I think it's gorgeous. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go to those lengths. You can build one yourself very cheaply. Um, 17 amp power battery was the first one I had, this off-grid. This was second-hand, again, repurposing as much as I could. Uh, I got an affordable 12-volt inverter, again, for the resiliency, the rel reliance that I need, the self-reliance I wanted to have. I wanted the possibility that if the other inverter broke, that I could just plug the 12-volt inverter into one of the, the batteries that I had, and quickly I've got power, I can charge up my phone, I can make contact with the internet. Um, and then these were the two solar panels that you saw earlier. They're quite light as well. You can carry these around. Um, so I, I, I've heard mixed reviews about these types of solar panels, but so far I've been pretty, pretty impressed. Uh, I also remember solar punk, okay? So I wanted to, what's here on the right is something called a solar kettle. It's a dark bottle filled with water inside of a transparent bottle. And what you can do on a summer's day, or even during the winter, if you're able to keep it insulated well enough, is you're able to heat up water. Um, I was able to get it here in Northern Europe up to around 40 degrees centigrade, sometimes 45 if it was particularly hot. You can add reflectors or mirrors behind it in order to bounce the, the, the photons back. The, the dark color of this bottle then will help the absorption of those photons, convert it into heat and transfer that heat to the water. You can then take the heat, the, the heated water into the kitchen and it's preheated for the kettle, which means that the kettle uses a less electricity from the grid. The same thing with the solar panel pictured here. This is a different panel that I was just using temporarily to test out. Um, was putting bottles behind it in order to cool the panel down, makes the panel more efficient, and also heats up the water for the use in the kitchen. And this is what I'm currently using the solar power for, given that it can't give me the, the reliability for, for the pie right now, is I'm using it to power uh, some grow lights. I'm growing some chilies, I'm doing sprouting. Um, again, all repurposed. None of this stuff was bought brand new, even repurposing an old yogurt pot. Um, 
and at the moment i'm power, i'm generating more than enough power even in the the european winter just to be able to light these these led lights here they're very very efficient the led lights were bought brand new by the way i couldn't really avoid that okay so calculating the scale of the system as this is actually a really good video that will give you more details on how to make these kinds of calculations the link is in the uh is in the slideshow it's by greg virgo so about 3.3 hours, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> now, generally, <clears throat> I alluded to this earlier as well, you're going to need, if you're going to buy a lead acid like I did, remember that lead acids, generally it's recommended that you only take them down to 50% depth of discharge. That's 50% of their overall capacity. Um, you can obviously take them down lower. It's a judgment call on your part as to what kind of an emergency you might be facing. But just bear in mind that, um, that you will be reducing the overall lifetime, usable lifetime of that lead acid battery, right? Uh, by orders of magnitude, right? You could be going from, you know, if you're, you're constantly taking it down to like 20% of its total capacity, um, you will be reducing it from a thousand cycles down to 300 cycles. So that clearly it's, it's beneficial, ideally, to cycle the battery from roughly 100% down to 50% and back up again, if we can. But always try to keep it above 50%. Okay, so let's do the maths. I know this is really boring, but hopefully all the right people are still watching. Uh, if you're watching, you are part of the resistance. So a Raspberry Pi 4 runs at eight watts on average. My Raspberry Pi fluctuates. I have it plugged into that little uh, USB monitor between five amps and 10 amps. Remember amps are the things that light the lamps. It's the body of water. It's the overall volume of energy, um, which means in 24 hours, we can expect let's say on average, eight watts multiplied by 24 hours. That gives us a, a new unit now I'm introducing, 192 watt hours, which is an overall amount or volume of power. So in Berlin, in Northern Europe here, we can expect up to, and sometimes more, 21 consecutive gray days in the winter. That's typically late November through to early February. And this can be devastating for your reliability. Therefore, we want to budget because we wanted the five nines of uptime. We wanted to make sure that even in the darkest days of the year, in the darkest periods of the year, that the Raspberry Pi could still be there, could still be processing lightning transactions and still syncing to the chain. So the calculation then would be, let's assume 21 days is our worst case. Remember that the battery of its lead acid could go a little bit below 50 and we said it's a judgment call. 21 times 192 watt hours would mean that we would need a battery system that could deliver four kilowatt hours of overall uh, volume. Are we still here? Am I still online? I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, we're still here. We're still right, here. Great, great. Okay. Okay. So, are you with me? So, if we're using a lead acid, we only want to take it down to 50%. That means that we need to double the overall volume of, of energy that we're going to need. So, we need to budget for a system of eight kilowatt hours. One of the things you're gonna notice in the marketing and the way that uh, the batteries are sold is of course that they're sold in amp hours. So it's fine, I've got you, I've got the calculation. How do we convert the watts into amps? Well, you do that by dividing the, the watts by the volts to get you back to the amps again. So two lead acid batteries in series will give us 24 volts. Um, that was a decision I made. You don't have to do that yourself, but the system that I made, I wanted to be able to power large scale things. I wanted that big inverter. I wanted to be able to heat water. So I put two lead acids in series. That doubles the voltage, but it keeps the amperage the same for reasons, because physics. So what we do is we take the eight kilowatt hours, we divide it by the 24 volts, and that means you're gonna need a battery system that can deliver 333 amp hours of volume, volume of energy. Um, that's quite a big system. So that will give you the 99% uh, uptime, uh, should at least, hopefully. And that, but the battery system is gonna cost you at the current prices in Europe around 1200 euros. Um, so obviously you could save money by doing what I did and just scaling it down a notch. Um, and that's gonna give you a footprint of around two square meters with the solar panels, depending on whether or not you could put the batteries underneath the panels themselves. You're looking at between four to five square meters of space. So if you're living in a city apartment, that might be a bit cozy for you, but if you're, you know, really hashtag reckless and you're really into the scene, then maybe you can make that compromise. The, the lead acid batteries are not portable. 
um, you're looking at between, well, my system is 120 kilos for those two batteries. It takes two people to lift it. Um, so this is not a system that you're going to, to want to move around a whole lot. With lithiums, it's a little bit better, but as I mentioned earlier, lithium batteries are more expensive. So ways that we could improve this system, of course, like we could scale the batteries back, uh, reduce the overall number of amps, but we could introduce a different energy source, renewable energy source. You could use wind. I've seen some people online that own property that have streams running through them, use some of these new, quite affordable hydro power generators, these little, it looks like a turbine. It is a turbine. You, you build a little installation around it in the water, it generates electricity. Apparently, the, obviously those things are much more reliable for uh, energy generation because the stream doesn't typically stop flowing. And so some people use that as a backup to their solar energy. Uh, with systems like wind, I've seen people plug in, you know, ho make homemade uh, wind turbines from old vacuum cleaner motors um, who've plugged them into solar charge controllers and the solar charge controller is able to process and regulate that power. I could remove the LED screen to save power. And actually, I was also thinking after I gave this presentation yesterday, you could also plug in a UPS hat onto the Pi. You can buy these little systems that take the, the lithium uh, 18650 batteries, um, the things that you find in the e-cigarette batteries and, and things like this. They're pretty ubiquitous, actually. You can get them from old laptops, buy them off of eBay, buy an old laptop, Dell laptop of eBay, strip it apart, take the 18650s out, and then you put it into the UPS for the Pi. It's a little gadget that goes on top. And then that can give you additional redundancy so that even if your, your big batteries go down, even if the sun doesn't come out, your Pi is still saved. You can be alerted that the power's gone out and you can safely bring it back indoors and plug it into the grid. And for in terms of expansion, I think speaking back to the, the, the reliance and the resiliency, you could connect it to a satellite. So you could connect to the Blockstream satellite and create additional redundancy for your network connection uh, as well. Right. So there you go. Uh, I, I give you, uh, as an outro, a veritable orgy of links for your edificational needs. Um, here's some really, really good links. Uh, so yeah, more on the battery, the cycling, the, some, something called the C rating. The way that battery manufacturers often market their batteries is they always give you the best uh, rating that they can give you. But this article here will tell you what to, to look out for so that you're not uh, scammed. Um, Fuse, please use fuses if I didn't make it clear. Circuit breakers um, as much as you can because safety is important. I don't want anyone uh, killing themselves over this. Um, how to make DIY systems, how to, to build. These are the LifePo batteries, which are all the rage right now. They're quite cheap in America, not so cheap at the moment in Europe, but they're set to come down in price. Um, yeah, lo lots of things really. Uh, so lots of links. Go, go click on them all. Go down the rabbit hole if you're so inclined and... Uh, Thanks. Thanks very much for watching. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. That was great. I, I mean, I, I love solar. I love renewables. Um, I, as I said off air, I, I built a couple of camper vans where I've used solar panels. And the first one I built 10 years ago, the solar panels, which I put on it, um, it didn't cost much, a couple hundred quid. Uh, but the the second one I built, the solar panels, you know, they were the, the, the th paper thin ones, which I just glued on top of the van. And they're so much more efficient. Um, and there's something about when you start just getting energy for free and you're just using it and you're thinking, well, there's no, I mean, obviously there's the cost of buying the equipment in the first place, but there's, there's then no outgoings, um, uh, for, for, for consuming electricity. So I'm building a house at the moment, an off grid house in this kind of fairly anarchist sort of settlement thing. That's all using renewables. So I have some solar panels on the roof and all the power tools, which I've used to build this wooden house, uh, have just been generated, they've just been powered by the solar panels. Um, and uh, I hope as well to, to add at some point, um, uh, you know, wind uh, to my um, to my system. But, you know, I quite like the fact that electricity becomes this commodity which you need to harness and then, you know, isn't infinite, like it's finite. You, you have to um, uh, make the most of the electricity you've got. You have to kind of keep an eye on how much electricity you've got in your batteries. But I do think that, you know, you take a magnifying glass and, and, and focus a small area of, um, you know, sunlight onto a piece of paper and you can set it on fire. Like there's a lot of energy coming from our sun. And if the more efficient solar panels get and the more able to harness um, that energy, uh, then the, um, uh, yeah, the, I, I, I don't think it will be uh, for, for longer, too much longer, be a, a finite resource we'll have to worry about. 
Um, yeah, uh, and, and all this technology is uh, um, getting better as time moves on. I saw a great presentation where they were using saltwater batteries to harness um, the electricity and store the electricity. They're much bigger, um, but then you know they're it's just so it's just salt it's just salt water so that it's very easy to recycle uh, there's a great i always noticed a, a connection between um uh, a lot of the you know og anarchists and geographers the anarchist geographers um uh, and um uh, yeah uh, and just, just, just anarchists and geographers sorry and i think the reason is that that when you think about you know when you're a geographer and you think about humans impact on 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 the world and on its environment ultimately you start to realize that it's society oh, did we just did it just say um what did it say did it just say uh live streaming is off okay don't worry i sorry chris I can't switched, hear you. i switched to my laptop from my, ah, my okay, okay. okay cool cool thanks yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, no there's a, there's 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 be, always been a connection between the anarchist movement and then the geographers because i think they realize that if human beings are going to um, harmonize with nature then they need to kind of scale down um uh, and look very locally at their local surroundings and their impact which they're having on the local surroundings um and then improve it through direct action and, and you know like you're saying with democracy through more direct direct democracy within the local area but i agree we need uh larger apparatus for complicated big systems and i think that's what fascinates me about bitcoin is you can have something which is you know uh, international uh, and then people can reach consensus on how it changes and improves um uh, and it gives me hope that you'll be able to have sort of big architecture and, and apparatus but then at the same time also have you know that idea of that anarchist idea of, of you know harnessing your own electricity of 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 of, of, of everybody decentralizing um uh, uh, uh humanity and and uh, uh having a more direct impact within their the local area and the local community so all fascinating stuff which i very much enjoyed and um uh, yeah and no, i very much enjoyed your talk there's a great murray bookchin uh quote which is uh, environmentalism believes in good management husbandry ecology believes in harmonization of humanity with nature the harmonization of humanity and nature depends fundamentally with humans harmonizing with each other the attitude that we've had uh, towards nature depends on our attitude we've had towards each other um so uh yeah i think it's all very much connected um uh, and and hopefully this is you know part 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 and parcel to the the world in which you know the better world in which we're building and you've married the two um uh disciplines the the solar renewables uh caring for the planet and then and, and bitcoin um uh, so that's great and as as have you uh Chuenzi, how is the project coming along you have muted oh sorry you muted mate need to unmute yourself <laughs> Chimenzi, don't know if you can uh, hear us. Okay, okay, sorry, <laughs> I forgot I was muted. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, cheers. Okay, so um, what Chris project was, was much like um, what I set out to do primarily as a hack to uh, navigate the challenges of um, being able to run my own full bitcoin node because um i got involved with bitcoin around 2015 and um i actually got serious about um bitcoin node operation around 2017 or thereabout but because of the difficulty and the you know the prevalent um lack of electricity you can't really dream of doing something like that from um, an african's uh uh perspective because we have energy crisis that actually doesn't have any sign of being solved anytime soon so i first of all began to solve the problem for myself because i needed to um, ensure my own uh, solve sovereignty and um, running a bitcoin node was one of those things i felt that i needed to do to ensure that i have the freedom that I really required for myself to operate the way I wanted to operate. 
especially being in the tech industry. Okay, so having done that, I put up a couple of um, articles and videos on Twitter and um, Medium, and they got really, really interesting attention from the Bitcoin community. And um, a lot of people started requesting for um, the hack itself. But, you know, the hack was more, more or less um, um, a difficult thing for people who are not tech-oriented to get involved with. So um, I had to think of how to turn it into a proper product that is ready for the market so that we'll be able to make it possible for anyone anywhere having similar um, uh, challenge that I was having to easily run a Bitcoin node without um, all the hassles that goes with it. And that's when we decided to turn it into a space box. And um, what you're seeing here is a prototype um, design of what is going to be like. Okay, so we, we want to have an integrated runaway kit, so to speak, such that if you pick up any of this device, all you need to get rolling actually will just be an internet access and a solar panel to go with it. In fact, in the editions that we're going to be bringing around, we're going to be alternating them between solar and um, uh, uh, wind uh, mill, so that if, if you want to use a wind, you, you want, if you think that wind will give you uh, more regular power, you can switch to wind. If you think that solar is okay for you, you can also use solar. So it's just to make sure that we have an integrated system that can do a lot of the heavy lifting that people encounter when they want to run a Bitcoin node. And of course, since I put out this um, prototype design out there, I've attracted a lot of attention from projects that are not really um, Bitcoin oriented. So, you know, you know, people run, Raspberry Pi has become very powerful these days. So people can run master nodes and they can actually become node validators for a lot of crypto projects. And many of them have indicated a lot of interest in actually um, using tools like this to hardware like this to um, help the growth of the ecosystem. Because primarily I was driven because most Africans are not represented on the infrastructure level when it comes to crypto assets. Many of us here are focused on trading and speculation. Okay, but the real um, game changer is when we can actually get a substantial part of our countrymen getting involved in the infrastructure layer, you know, running Bitcoin nodes, running Litecoin nodes, running um, Tezos node, and all kinds of nodes, because they are economically empowering for people who get involved with them. And that's exactly one of the things that I hope to achieve with this project. So typically, it's going to be a, a system that will have all that Chris has already mentioned. You have a charge regulator, you have an inverter system, you have a lithium battery. Then we're building in extra two USB ports that support um, up to three ampires. Then we, we are trying to also make sure that it can actually do much more than um, being used as a node operator kit. If you don't want to use them as a node operator kit, you can actually use them to charge your mobile phone, charge your laptop. You can actually turn the, the, the system into an educational tool by just plugging in um, an external monitor to it and you'll be able to actually use it to, to do educational stuff. So we have a three-way charging system currently in the build and um, you can actually charge with a solar panel you can charge with a cigarette lighter on your from your car, or you can actually use a, a grid system. Maybe you have a, a charging port in your house. You can actually use it to, to charge it. And the lithium battery that we have designed should be able to give you sustained life for the device for up to 48 hours. Okay, so here are some of the specifications that we, we designed into it. Extra two ports for USB charging of phone or whatever you need to charge. 
Also, we are providing uh, a 12 volt um, uh, alternative charging output for internet routers because to run fully decentralized, you need to have an internet router powered to be able to do that. Of course, um, we are also talking about how to you know, leverage Blockstream satellite uh, system. But you know, currently the Blockstream system broadcasts the internet, but you don't um, relay back information. So it's a one-way traffic for now. But as soon as we have a, a go around, it would be nice to see how you can actually have a satellite system that can be hooked up to this so that you can create a more elaborate area network to cover, especially for disadvantaged environments. We have gone ahead to create um, additional tools like a space pay project that will be a software that will be um, running inside uh, and managing the space box itself. We have um, an MVP version of it that is around currently. And um, we are hoping that latest before the end of the first quarter of 2021, we should have physical products and um, before then, too, we should have also launched the Space Pay app because the Space Pay app will help in uh, driving micropayments and uh, bill collection for Bitcoin across the regions where we are, especially. And um, if you have a space box, we have a facility where you can connect the space box to the... Uh, app itself and manage it just like you, you could use uh, maybe Zeus to manage your your node. You could use our app to manage it in addition to the app doing so many other things. So we, we have a couple of um, uh, people who are helping to advise. We have uh, Christian who is a lead dev for Rasbliss project and um, he has been helpful, helpful also for most of the things that we have done so far. So we're looking forward to seeing this project succeed. Um, a few months ago, we, we did a crowdfunding for some kind of seed um, investment from the community to help us get off the ground and at least get a few of these um, hardware uh, in the space so that people can easily uh, test it out before we go into mass production. And that's where we are right now. So if there are questions, I'll be happy to... Oh, wow, congrats. Yeah, I'll be happy to answer the questions. Yeah, well done on the uh, initial raise there. Um, no, it's a great project. It's lovely. Yeah. Do you, are you So like um, Chris is hoping to do with his, because obviously you, you do lose a lot of efficiency by going 12 to 230 to, to 5 um, volts. Uh, are you going to go... Are you going to have like... Are you going to invert down using a little module? To get to step down from twelve volt to five volt, and then uh, and then, but then also have the inverter in there so people can use this for uh, charging their laptops and phones and whatnot. I, I didn't get that question. Was that a question? Yeah, it's a question. Are, have you got like two? Um, so when you you've got you obviously you've got a, a, a twelve volt storage battery inside there. Yeah. Um, and then you're inverting um, and. So people can plug in like a, a, a you know appliance like a plug like a two forty uh, volt appliance, um, but then also you're powering your Raspberry Pi which is five volts at like you know four amps or three amps or whatever it is. Um, so you can just go from twelve volt to five volt for the Raspberry Pi, and then you're not losing um, all that power just in converting to two forty volt to uh, and then back down to five volts. By going through the inverter so if you've got like two so you do step down separately to um without using the inverter to the raspberry pi okay so um the way it works is this um you know solar is giving off stream is on live streaming is on and we're back <laughs> sorry about that yeah sorry uh joan z carry on we're back on okay so can I continue? Yes, yes, please do. Okay, so um, the solar um, panel gives us 12 volts, which um, charges our 12 volts um, lithium battery. Then the job of the inverter is to be able to allow you to use 
um, grid power that comes with maybe 240 volts or thereabouts to um, step it down and charge the battery again. Now, for you to charge something like a laptop on it, you're going to use the 12 volts output, the DC 12 volts, to charge something like a laptop. And it works um, perfectly that way. So um, you're not going to use a 240 volts appliance on the system. And of course, you know that lithium batteries has the capacity to sustain life for a, a longer period than deep cells or even ordinary um, electrolyte batteries. Okay, so we, we created the, the additional two sources of charging to compensate for probably when you are running down of power and there is not much um, sunlight to um, recharge the system, you could easily use the grid power, the regular electricity power to charge it up again. Or you can use the cigarette lighter um, socket from a, any vehicle at all to recharge it. So that, that's the, the design process for it. Hope yeah, that questions. Yeah, that, that, that answers it more or less. I think there probably is, um, I think maybe that you could have an efficiency saving by stepping down from the lithium ion straight to yeah. the Raspberry Pi. So you can use the inverter to charge the battery is what Chemezi is saying. Is yes. that right? Okay. But is there still no way just to put one of these small uh, step downs to power the Pi on a parallel circuit or? Well, um, that, that would be over leveraging the, the device because don't forget that primarily you, you want to keep your Raspberry Pi on for 247. And um, you're going to power a couple of other things apart from the Raspberry Pi itself. There's going to be a fan. There's right. a fan inside the device that needs to stay on, cooling both the, the hard disk and the, the internals of the Raspberry Pi because you, it's an enclosure. Typically, you would have exposed it. If you want, if you're not going to use a fan, so you compensate for that fan by making sure that you don't, you know, add stuff that will consume much more power. Okay, typically um, five volt fan would have worked, but we are putting a twelve volt fan on it to be able to provide sufficient cooling for both the 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 inverter itself and the Raspberry Pi, and twelve volts um, going off on the fan and the Raspberry Pi consuming 5 volts and 3 amperes. That's, we have that's... calculated at full charge, it could do up to 24 hours for the Raspberry Pi, and probably you need to find an alternative source to sustain the fan. Because on, this, on the body of the device, we're also going to have um, like a battery uh, meter that will tell you where the battery strength is and you can turn off um the 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 fan or leave it on fan typically uses its own motor and because this is on motor it's likely to consume more power yeah it's going to be it's going to be in a warm environment as well because obviously yeah you know you're, you're harnessing that solar energy aren't you i mean that's another good tip actually for solar stuff is make them wires short from your solar panel to your to your battery to your controller um because uh you lose a lot of uh power in 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 those 12 volt wires um uh but yeah it's going to be in a warm environment because I, I mean on my um uh full node i'm able to use passive um uh, heat sink so not how to, once it's done all the initial block syncing stuff uh it's fine off passive but then obviously for the initial block syncing stuff you need something a bit more hardcore to cool those raspberry pi fours down because they are they do get warm and uh, creating heat with electricity isn't efficient, as we as we know. <laughs> uh, so, but no, it's um, yeah, it's good, man. It's good. If you got, um, it'd be good to see in the presentation more info on the actual like electronics inside, how it's all put together. At some point. Yes, yes, I I have the hack. I'll I'll share the the hack components so they just get a feel of what. That'd be cool. Was there? The box is nice too. The box is really nice. Um. <laughs> 
it's quite good for sorry chris it's quite good fun as well chris isn't it like when you you have um you know obviously a house which is powered by uh electricity provide an energy provider but then to start suddenly start powering have your own like energy source which then starts to take over the house and you use your energy provider less and less and you kind of get that autonomous feeling <laughs> yeah i mean it's sort of taught me actually using solar just how scarce energy is um and you know the problem with the grid system is that, it, that the reality of the universe is obscured away by a political reality which is a lot of these western countries that grew out of a colonialist past you know they gave us this abundance this apparent abundance um you know where we have this you know always on if i need light in the evening if i need to heat some water it's no problem i've got an unlimited energy source uh, in the wall here i just plug it in and away i go whereas when you when you're self-powering you start to realize actually you're not in harmony with nature because no. if it's nighttime there's no light if your battery's dead your battery's dead you just have to take it yeah you're right and it's completely abstracted away isn't yeah. it yeah and that's a political reality that we currently live in we're here because our governments have diplomats and they go and they negotiate for us and they have a military to, to, to guard our interests so it's definitely brought me back to reality but yeah let's look at Chimezi's yes, slide. yes here we are this is nice that's what i want to see okay so 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 this is the the drawing the the hack itself so anyone can actually put this together if you feel about it nice. so you what i try to do is to build this entire system here where you have um the solar controller the raspberry pi 4 the inverter stroke charger the battery system all put together in a single runaway kit so to speak that's what i decided to call it so you could just ah, get the kit yeah. and you just have the solar panel to add to it to sufficiently get yourself started yeah that's nice yeah. The, the the usb on the actual controller that will be doing exactly what that module which chris has got does which is going exactly. straight straight from the 12 volt to the 5 volt yeah exactly. nice yeah, exactly 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 yeah i actually did have some data loss though on the raspberry pi 4 powering it directly from the solar controller because unfortunately those cheap pwms uh don't regulate the power quite as well as the pi 4 needs it so the Pi 4 is actually a th full three amps, as you know. It's the amps, um, yeah. It needs it for the hard drive. So it must not go lower than, than three amps. Otherwise, the hard drive was, you know, some bits are going to start flipping and you're going to lose some data, which if you're running lightning is going to be critical. It's really annoying as well because it because it's on you know your pie is on and it looks like it's working you don't think that the the energy you don't think that's the problem you know yeah you're using an inefficient um uh you know uh, usb adapter or whatever just your phone usb adapter because you can see that it's working you can see on the screen but it's like why is it so slow why is it yeah why is it crashing why are we getting all these bugs and it's just the power source <laughs> but like i said i mean chimesi could easily uh, just add a little hat on top of the pie and put a couple of 18650s which are dirt cheap if you if you're going to china chimesi you're going to you know easily be able to snap those up for pennies um preferably get some upcycled ones you know get some ones that have been sent back for recycling um and that will give your users enough time to plug it into the wall if the the other battery is uh lagging you know you know when when, when the prototype is um at least if we have the functional prototype first and we can begin to do all the embellishments that you could add after you've gotten the system doing very well. For, for instance, we could have um, a, a button control the screen of the Raspberry Pi separately. And you could turn off the, the, the screen of the Raspberry Pi that is on the device. You could turn it off and save power. Okay. And the same way, you could also turn off the, the, the 12 volts fan and also save power. Okay. But all those things will come out when they have gotten the basic um, structure all defined, and we can now begin to do all those ones. I listen, I like I like this about you. I like your approach because it's completely the opposite to mine, which is just like I'm in all different directions. Think, oh, I could do this. I could do that. I could do this. You're like, no, I'm going to build this, and I'm going to build it this way. And then once that's done, 
I'll then mm. improve it. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Yes. And that's in fact the correct way to do things. Otherwise you just end up tying yourself in knots and you never get anything. Exactly. Done. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The, the whole fantastic ideas yeah. that one could um, actually explore, yeah. exploit. I mean, um, a whole lot that we can do. We've talked with um, Chris for the development and he could do some software thing for us that will also help us to like um, do either a, a, a geolocation of the device so you can actually know where the device are and where, where they're using, apart from using typical uh, Bitcoin node monitor to uh, find out where the nodes are. We could actually geolocate them to be the, you know to be able to know where they are and what they're being used for yeah. because they are they are typically internet oriented you can actually build it's also possible to build in um a, a router into the system if you really want okay because it's it's all about um you know getting some kind of um uh, module that yeah. could do they search for a 4G network and connect it and everything just goes on. So you're just dealing with probably one system and a solar panel and have yeah. everything all integrated into the system. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe when, you, when you're talking about um, not even being reliant upon internet, that, you know, in Germany they have this Freifunk, uh, the router systems where people pack their routers and then mesh them together. Like that might be possible. So, but again, it's going in all different directions. You just want to get <laughs> this made. Yeah. What I would like to see, actually, is I do think those screens which we use on the um, the Raspberry Blitzers, I mean, you can feel the heat coming off and they're really inefficient. And I actually take mine off and I replace it with a little OLED screen, which just reads out, you know, like the IP address and like the temperature of the the the, the Raspberry Pi and like, you know, uh, the processor as well. And that's a really simple Python script. And the OLED, which I use, it just draws like nothing, like an inconsequential amount of electricity out of the um, out of the pie itself. Um, uh, so maybe, you know, at some point you can have your screen, but then like you say, like you can turn the screen off, dim it, turn it off, uh, and then maybe just have some little other, you know, read out like a tiny little OLED thing or something attached to it. It's a, this is, I think actually what is this, what I like about the project is there's lots of directions you could take in. That's great. Have we got any questions from the audience anymore? Yeah, questions? that's true. Uh, <laughs> this, there we are. That's good. Um, Crypto BTC Anarchist says, "Nice one. Where can we get one from?" And I, I think that's you know, I think that's a fair point. Like, it's the price. I really, I think the price point is so good. You know, if for people just shopping for nodes, um, they'll think, "Well, yeah, I'm going to spend a little bit more and have a node which has its own power source, um, which has its own you know redundancy, even if I've just plugged it in at home." um uh if my you know i have a power cut here which isn't un unusual i've had we've had power cuts before it won't kill my node because i know it's attached to this lithium-ion battery um and then also has like a solar thing as well if i want to plug that in so i think there's i think you, you might i mean you're designing it for obviously use um in uh you know in, in your in your in your local area but i think that you'll probably see people buying them from all over the world just because they that's just it's just a useful unit to have but yeah, no. So yeah, yeah we, we hope that um, we'll start solving the problem from our local environment, and um, anywhere, anywhere else, anyone else needs it. Of course, you can get it. Unfortunately for us, I think the very first order I got for the hack was from uh, Columbus in somewhere in Canada. Yeah, one location like that that I had to use Google to even locate before I could send the kit to to the guy. Okay, so. That tells you that it could be in demand, even in the least expected environment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, I mean, so when it comes to actually buying one, are they, they're not market ready yet, are they? Um, yeah, they are not market ready yet, and um, that is the journey of prototyping. Yeah, we are hoping that before the end of uh, the first quarter next year, we should have something really impressive for oh, the great. market. Okay, yeah, because um, you know, you know, when when you have when you go through the prototyping process and you don't have a product, the next thing is to start thinking of um, mass production, and that's actually where we'll be needing um, early stage funding. For now, we just want to drive and see how far we can go, because yeah. um, I'm very certain that there will be a couple of companies that would like to back the project 
if not just for Bitcoin community, but for even the tech environment also, because it will make a very good difference in in homes, especially in developing worlds. Oh, so to just using it as a computer system, um, mm. uh, not just not ju just as a uh, you know a, a Bitcoin node. It would be it would be useful uh, in developing countries. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, uh, no, I don't think we've got any more questions. Just um, we're all looking forward to it coming out so we can buy one because uh, it's a nice price point and uh, it's. I love it. It's not. It's not. I'm sick and tired of seeing hardware scams popping up, and this is definitely not a hardware scam. So, yeah, keep up the excellent work, man. And uh, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was refreshing to you know the the Citadel nonsense. <laughs> Does, it does annoy me, you know. Like, like you say, we've got to get move away from this expectation that we're, the endpoint is is a, a apocalypse, Mad Max. Um, uh, yeah, I think humanity has the ability to do better than that, and and and, and I don't think there's any harm in using, you know, a, a word like utopian as harmonizing with nature and and having a forest of Endor type planet. Uh, but you know, we have to do some things be before we get there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for having us on. That's yeah, it's cool. Cheers, mate. All right, cheers, Chemsy. And uh, yeah, I'm going to end the stream. Thanks for everyone for watching. Please do like, subscribe, and all that stuff because it, it helps get all the content out there. And then also just chill on Twitter and whatever else. Um, and um, yeah, check out uh, the uh, Spacebox. Uh, what's the website for Spacebox? Sorry. Oh, you muted again. Yeah, muted. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Do you have a website, Chimezi, or a Twitter handle? Yeah, I, I just want to give the, the website. Or oh, Twitter handle is better. You can do Chimezi Twitter art. At Chimezi Twitter is okay. Just at Chimezi. And all the info, so you can get all the info from there. I'll put the, the, the info in the um, description as well. Twitter. That's Twitter handle for it. There we go. Cool. And then Chris, uh, you're Mr. Chris Alice on Twitter. People I am. check out your stuff there. Have you got? A, I'll put a link for the presentation. Um, yeah, I popped it in the chat here on Jesse, ah, so just uh, ah, cool. copy that. Ah, cool. There we are. And I'll pop that in there. Then. Sweet. All right. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, cool, to guys. everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right. Bye.